I just like to go about my work. I'm kind of a lone wolf when it comes to research. So the fame really just added to stuff I didn't need. I just felt like I would have preferred that the whole WannaCry fame never happened. Now that you're an internationally celebrated security researcher, what's your, uh, what's your reception been like? It's been very positive. Uh, I'm not really used to the sort of like the spotlight. I've always been anonymous, so it's very different, but everyone has been very accommodating, very nice. I've enjoyed it a little bit. After WannaCry blew over, I went on vacation in Vegas for a hacker conference. DEF CON is basically one big week-long hacker party with some talks in between. We actually spent a lot of the time just out and around Vegas partying. We rented some sports cars. We went to some shooting ranges. Also, a few of my friends had figured out that if we pulled all our money together, we could get an entire mansion with 30 bedrooms and the biggest pool in Vegas. Towards the end of my week in Vegas, as I was waiting for my flight home, someone in CBP uniform approached me and asked me my name. They led me to an interrogation room built into the airport, and it turned out that the guy was actually an FBI agent. At this point, like, I'm completely exhausted. I have no idea what's going on anymore. I've been drinking for days solid. Most interrogation, it seemed like they were looking to leverage me to get to someone else, something which I was not able or wanted to do. They asked me a huge bunch of questions, but it wasn't until about an hour into the interrogation that they actually told me what it was about and showed me an arrest warrant. People weren't immediately quite sure why he had been arrested. Initially, we thought that he got arrested because he uh, registered the WannaCry domain. It had caught me so off guard, I still didn't really know what was happening or why. I was just sat there in this haze. It transpired that it was because of his work, very much prior to WannaCry. They didn't have a cell for me, so they handcuffed me to a chair. So I spent most of the night trying to doze off and then getting woken up by the alarm that goes off every 20 minutes. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. Hey, Mark, can you hear me? Hey, uh, I'm in jail. Okay, so they detained you. Uh, yeah, um, I, I used to write malware and they, they picked me up from some old shit. Uh, have you talked to them at all? Uh, have you got a lawyer yet? No, I, I, I don't have a lawyer. They have some chat logs of me with some other guy. I don't know how they got them. Look, I'm going to work on it. You'll have a lawyer tomorrow, and you'll speak with a lawyer. All right, see you, man. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. There was a moment of I'm I'm really actually in jail. But after that, I came to the conclusion that this is how my life is now. I'm in jail, I might as well get used to it. It didn't take long for an indictment to drop. And he was accused of creating the Kronos malware. That was very much a, a whole moment. So the charges turn uh, turned out to relate to something that I believe started around kind of the age of 17 to maybe like 19 or 20 in relation to writing a piece of malware called Kronos. Kronos malware is banking malware. It essentially infects your computer and hooks into your web browser and tries to figure out your usernames and passwords for your banking login. I don't think he's ever been behind the keyboard trying to steal credentials or trying to extract money out of bank accounts himself. It was that person enabling somebody else through tools. So it's a very kind of scientific, kind of hobby interest kind of uh, exploration. I never had actually intended to write banking malware. I had written malicious code in the past which I had not actually sold or given away. But there came a point when I made the mistake of selling the code to someone 
this code was then uh, incorporated with um, banking malware code that someone else had written to make a, a banking trojan. And kind of it was at that moment where I realized like there is no going back. This is going to catch up with me at some point. So the hearing today was to determine whether or not Marcus would be detained as a result of the charges and the indictment. And the judge agreed with me in saying that he is going to be released pending certain conditions that he has attached to the bond and that he has to post a $30,000 cash bond. I started to look about how I would actually go about paying the bail, but before I could get to that, I found out that someone from the community had actually paid it for me. I thought that like this was it, I was going to be stuck in some prison for the foreseeable future and I had no idea all of these great people had come together to support me. I had mixed feelings about the case. Most of the issue I had personally is why now? Like why bring up this stuff from years in the past? I think the FBI was trying to make an example of Marcus. But I think they bit off more than they could show. Marcus Hutchins is a brilliant young man and a hero. He is going to vigorously defend himself against these charges. I did not know how to feel. It just felt like everything was coming to an end, but not in a good way.